to introduce Dr. Shraman Prakash. Dr. Shraman Prakash obtained his PhD in theoretical physics at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, focusing on string theory. He has a bachelor's degree in physics from John Hopkins University, where he received Provost Award for undergraduate research. A master's degree in physics from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, where he received awards for best academic performance and best project work. He is a faculty member at the Physics and Computer Science Department of the Alberg Educational Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Shiraman Prakash for his presentation. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me to give the talk. The title of the talk is, is Quantum Mechanics, Gravity and Strings. So, extremely successful quantum theories exist for describing elementary particles and their interactions via electromagnetic and nuclear forces. However, combining quantum mechanics with gravity, which is understood as the dynamics of space and time in Einstein's theory of general relativity, leads to serious technical and conceptual difficulties. And despite the fact that direct tests of, of uh, and any theory of quantum gravity seem out of reach. The problem of quantum gravity is one of immense theoretical interest. Quantum and classical theories cannot coexist consistently, so all forces, including gravity, must be described by quantum mechanics, or else quantum mechanics must be modified. I'll give a, a, a short summary of the problem of quantum gravity, in, in particular the focusing on the black hole information loss paradox, and, and finally, uh, I'll tell you why string theory is probably an in-principle solution to the problem of quantum gravity. So, so what is quantum mechanics? We will, we've all called seen the double slit experiment. So the idea is consider shoot an electron to, through two slits and, and see what happens, and you, and you find that the electron behaves like a wave, in the sense that if you if you if you shoot an electron through this two slit experiment many times, you'll see an interference pattern characteristic of wave-like behavior. And of course, if, if the electron is a wave, then I mean, I mean the wave-like behavior arises from interference between the two paths that the electron could have taken. Which, which in turn implies that, that you, you can't answer the question which, which slit did the electron go through. And, and more precisely, what, the, the idea is that, that there's, there's a notion of complementarity. Either you see an interference pattern or you can ask which slit the electron went through. But if you try to answer both questions with complete certainty, you'll, you'll run and you won't be able to do it. Just so, so, so you can generalize that work to, to, to quantum mechanics in a, in a, to general systems, and, and the, the basic postulates of quantum mechanics can be stated as follows. Say, say you observe an electron at point A. At time t later, you choose to carry out an experiment to determine whether or not the electron is at point B. This, this, is, this is the input from the experimenter in choosing what experiment to set up. Then, this, then quant, what quantum mechanics tells you is you just sum over all possible paths which the electron could have taken connecting A and B. With each path, you associate the phase, and these phases add and interfere to give a probability amplitude which, which you want to square and to get the, the distribution just as in the double slit experiment. Okay, finally, nature chooses the result of your experiment randomly according to the calculated probability distribution. So, 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 so quantum mechanics tells you how to calculate probability amplitudes, but you have to first tell, tell quantum mechanics what probability amplitudes you want to calculate okay, by choosing what you want to observe. And then some might, might object that Okay, well, what's described in the last slide and, and also in the Charles slide might overemphasize the role of the observer. I won't really address that here, but this is some quotes from Boris, or Niels Boris. Or so in our description of nature, the purpose is not to disclose, disclose the real essence of phenomena, but just to track down as far as possible relations between the 
multiple aspects of our experience. And regarding the fact that, that you know, ultimately there's, there's a choice of what to observe, which, which is required to, to specify mathematically precisely specify quantum mechanics. I mean, I mean, we have to make a choice between the different complementary types of phenomena we want to study. But okay, we're not, I'm not going to discuss too much about, about this here, so, so I suggest reading von Neumann's book on quantum mechanics and also the work of Henry Stapp for, for more on this. But okay, despite their perhaps intrinsically subjective nature, quantum theories make extremely accurate predictions of experimental observations. The list of experimental tests of quantum gravity is very long, but the most well-known example is the electron's magnetic moment, which can be calculated using quantum electrodynamics, which is the quantum theory of electrons, positrons, and photons. So the electron's magnetic moment is given by by this formula, which is parameterized by a parameter a, a sub e. It's, it's, a sub e is small, but non-zero, and is determined by P2ED calculations, which, which are straightforward in principle, but tedious in, in practice, and then they just depend on one parameter, the fine structure and constant alpha. So, so as far as the best measurements of the electron's magnetic moment were carried out by a group led by Gerald Gabriels at, at Harvard, which determined A to be about, with, to a, with, to an, with a relative uncertainty of about 0.25 parts per billion, and the techniques here you know, used ion traps, which, which may be similar to the realization of, of quantum computers. So, this, the, the, the 2D was, in fact, tested much more stringently than the inventors could have ever envisioned, as, as, as Freeman Dyson said to, to Gerald Gabriels, he's, as one of the inventors, I remember we thought of QED as a temporary and jerry-built structure with mathematical inconsistencies and the normalized infinities swept under the rug. We did not expect it to last more than 10 years before some more solidly built theory would would replace it, and we expected and hoped that some new experiments would real, reveal discrepancies that would point the way to a better theory. But nevertheless, QED is, is very successful. So, but what are the new experiments that, that we, we use to, to study the fundamental forces and, and, and quantum mechanics? And the main experiments that, that this is carried out, that the high energy physicists carry out, involve the scattering of elementary particles, such as those which happened at the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, so what? So, so the basic idea is is you collide a system. You consider a system of okay, not not non-relativistic particles, but you consider a, a, a collision of many particles, which initially are infinitely far away from each other and hence non-interacting. Each has a well-defined energy and momentum. The particles then collide, and, and we don't know what happens in between, which we, where we use quantum mechanics. But long after the collision, the system again consists of one or more outgoing particles infinitely far away from each other and non-interacting with a well-defined energy and momentum. So a typical scattering element experiment has many possible outcomes. The total number of outgoing particles may be different from the in incoming particles, the types of particles may be different, and the energy and momenta of each individual particle may be different. But the, the idea is we, w we want to predict the results of these parents. We want to define a matrix called the S matrix, which lists the probability amplitude for each possible outcome as a function of the incoming particles and their momenta. Conservation of information implies that S matrix is unitary and, and vice, vice versa. And though S matrix really only describes scattering elements, in, in principle we, we would think it, it encodes nearly all conceivable physical physical, physical experiments one one can carry out at least. Okay, I, I think. 
as matrix elements are calculated using a sum over paths similar, similar to what I said, just in this case a sum over Feynman diagrams and as pictured. And each diagram contributes to the probability amplitude, which we then square to obtain the probability of a given outcome. So although we can we can determine the final states and the initial states, we cannot determine what happened at intermediate times any more that we can determine which the, the electrons went through after we observed the interference pattern. So since, since, since all, all we're interested in is the initial and final states, there was an approach in the 60s to it which is described here that, that because there is an ever-growing list of strongly interacting particles, the idea was simply to just define an S matrix telling you the results of staggering experiments. And, and forget about any underlying quantum theory in which you would derive this matrix. Of course, it, it, it turned out that the, that, that the forces are described by a, a more a quantum field theory, which has a bit more content, and that all, all forces are, are actually described by not only an S matrix, but the quantum field theory, which, and a quantum field theory associates one or more abstract observables to each point in space. So, so an abstract observer located at X can in principle measure of pi of x any time, any, any number of times according to his or her subjective choice. And that's that's perhaps a bit more than, than what you might and a priori that seems like it's more than, than an S matrix, but but in practice when we test quantum field theory we just derive a, an approximate S matrix for the quantum field theory and compare that to the results of of scattering experiments. So, 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 so all the fundamental forces are ultimately described by, by quantum field theory, except for gravity. And in practice, their tests are it's the the some of the strongest experimental tests are simply scattering experiments. So, where we predict the probabilities for final states given the known initial states. Unfortunately, okay, a gra gravity is, is, is harder to deal with. So, so general relativity tells us that gravity describes the dynamics of space and time. A quantum theory of gravity would, in principle, have to be a quantum theory without time, or at least drastically alter our notions of space and time. And okay, we can we can make this more precise by considering the predictions of classical general relativity and and quantum mechanics when, when we study black holes. So black holes are, are, are things which exist in, in space. For example, there's an X-ray X source in the galaxy called Cygnus N1, which is probably a, a black hole. And of course, you, you, and, and was a subject of, of a wager between Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorns. So, how okay, ultimately I mean I mean black holes exist I'll tell you what the black hole is in a minute, but black holes exist in the sky, but how do you know if some astrophysical object is a black hole? Because you can only you can only via indirect measurements of, of light coming from nearby the black hole try to to rule out all other possibilities that it's not a neutron star, it's not some, some other object and, and convince yourself that the densities of matter and energy are so high that, that a given astrophysicist can only, astrophysical object can only be a black hole and nothing else. So, so there's, all, there's always some uncertainty when you observe a black, a candidate black hole in the sky and Stephen Hawking wagered that, that Cygnus X1 is not a black hole and Krypton wagered that it is, but it turned out that it is, so Stephen Hawking lost that wager. Okay, so what is a black hole precisely? If, if, if enough mass is placed in a small enough region of space, a black hole will form. More precisely, that there will be a critical, I mean, a black hole is some gravitational object that there's a critical distance from which the escape velocity from that object becomes greater than the speed of light. 
and special relativity tells you that, that no object can travel faster than the speed of light. So an analogy for a black hole is if, in terms of just, just easily understandable physics is consider fish swimming in a stream of water such that no fish can swim faster than a, a speed c relative to the waters. If the velocity of water changes depends on it changes with, with location like near a waterfall then then you can you can imagine a then so, so if if you have a velocity distribution such as this a fish a fish swimming here can can swim up to here but also swim swim back because the fish can only move relative to the to the can only move at a speed c relative to the water, but if once the water is, is moving in a given direction faster than the speed c, then there's no way a fish can can swim back from where it came. So there's, there's a critical point of no return where the velocity equals c, as, as should be obvious from this diagram. So since it's not even light can escape the black hole, there are effectively one-way surfaces in space-time that absorb but do not emit. Okay, in, in the 1970s, Hawking discovered that black holes in a quantum theory must radiate. Okay, the, the reason is that okay, heuristically, in the vacuum of a quantum field theory, pairs of particles and antiparticles continually pop into existence and then collide and annihilate each other. However, if a pair of particles pops in and out of existence very close to a black hole, then one might fall into the black hole while the other escapes to infinity and then that that becomes a source of radiation. That becomes a source of radiation. So and even 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 just on general grounds from, from Einstein's A and B arguments, you, you know in a quantum theory anything which absorbs must emit. However all black holes of a given mass charge and momentum are identical, hence Radiation emitted from a black hole is independent of the matter and information that form the black hole. Moreover, it turns out that the radiation is thermal with a temperature that depends on the mass of the black hole. As the black hole emits radiation, it loses energy and, and mass and becomes smaller till it eventually evaporates, leaving behind a universe filled with thermal radiation. And in which case, all information about the matter that formed the black hole is apparently lost. So, so, so this this is a, a contradiction with the quantum mechanics, in which, which necessarily preserves information and and leads to a bit of a debate. So, general people who, who spent their life studying general relativity believe that indeed information swallowed by a black hole would be lost, whereas People coming from particle physics backgrounds who study more quantum mechanics believe that information would have to be preserved somehow. In particular, there, there's, a, there's a famous wager between Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne, who are general relativists, and John Kreskel, who's a quantum field theorist and quantum information theorist. And, and the, the, the wager goes as, as follows. Whereas Kip, Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne firmly believe that information swallowed by a black hole is forever hidden from the outside universe and can never be revealed even as the black hole evaporates and completely disappears. And whereas John Preskill firmly believes that a mechanism for the information to be released by the evaporating black hole must and will be found in the quantum theory of gravity, therefore Preskill offers in Hawking such one except a wager that when an initial pure state undergoes gravitational collapse to form a black hole, the final state at the end of black hole evaporation will always be a quantum state. And the loser will reward the winner with an encyclopedia of the winner's choice, which from which information can be recovered at will. And this fact was in 1997 at Caltech. So, so, so how, how, how can we resolve the effect? So experimental tests of quantum gravity are Im impossible. Even Hawking radiation can't yet be observed. 
but but the question is, is it theoretically possible, even in principle, to define a quantum theory that has gravitational interactions in its classical limit, but is otherwise a unitary quantum theory? And for that, that and it turns out that such a theory does exist, which is called string, string theory, and I'll describe it now. So, so string theory is based on the assumptions that instead of particles, the the, the elementary excitations of of nature are, are string string like objects. So a particle traces out a world line in space time and a, hence a string would trace out a world sheet in space time. Quantum mechanics of strings are described by some over world sheets where where the to calculate the probability a, a string would be observed somewhere else, we, we sum over world sheets from the initial string, or more precisely, different vibrational modes of the string correspond to different elementary particles. But interactions are described by a sum over world sheets which converge and split, just, just like Feynman diagrams. So, okay, remarkably, for reasons I won't discuss, gravitational. The, the, Interactions automatically emerge from the sum over world sheets, and 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 there's a price to pay for the defining consistent sum over world sheets in the sense that one needs extra dimensions and supersymmetry. But we, but but as a matter of principle, the question is: Can we define a, a, a unitary quantum theory that includes gravitational interactions? So the point is: the sum over world sheets defines a unitary S matrix which allows us to break the probability and amplitudes for any scattering experiment in, a, in, in, in this quantum theory, which, which includes gravity. So that means if, if string theory is correct, we should be able to use it to predict outcomes of a collision of any number of particles with any, any energies. In particular, we should be able to consider initial states with enough particles and enough energy to form a black hole according to classical gravity. String theory would predict that the probability distribution for different outgoing particles would predict the probability amplitude for different outgoing particles, which would be like Hawking radiation, but not quite, to be observed in the far future after the black hole would have evaporated. But, however, the prediction must preserve all, for the outgoing states, must, must preserve all quantum information about the initial state because this S matrix defined by string theory is unitary. So, so this is an, an in principle answer to the question of, of of quantum gravity, and what but but what, what, what is a more more physical interpretation of it? Gravity, well, gravity is the dynamics of space and time. So, since the sum over world sheets includes gravitational interactions, it it also can be thought of as including the sum over all space-time geometries interpolating between the initial and final states. Of course, in the semi-classical limit, one would expect only the space-time geometry containing a black hole to dominate the sum over space-times. But okay, calculations involving what, in, the, in the 90s showed that actually contribution from other space-times without a black hole do have a contribution to sum over space-times, which is non-negligible on time scales long enough for the black hole to evaporate. So the, the basic idea is, is just like in the two-slit experiment to predict, predict the results of observations, we have to sum over space-time geometries, those with a black hole and those without a black hole, to predict the, the outgoing Particles we see after a black hole evaporates. Oh, yeah, and, and this this argument actually convinced Hawking that information is preserved, and, and he conceded his bet to John Kriskin. So, in his own words, he, he says that black hole formation and evaporation can be thought of as a scattering process. One sends in particles and radiation from infinity and measures what came back out to infinity. All measurements are made at infinity where fields are weak. So one never probes the strong field region in the middle. So, so you're never sure that the black hole forms, no matter how certain it might be in classical, in the classical theory. And 
The confusion and paradox arose because people thought classically in terms of a single topology for space-time. So there's either a flat space or a black hole, but the Feynman similar histories allows it to be both at once. One can't tell which, which topology contributed to the observation any more than one can tell which slit the electron went through in the two slits experiment. All the then observation at infinity can determine is that there's a unitary mapping from initial and states to final states, and that information is not lost. So th this is this is Hawking's ideas, but but everyone isn't convinced. Kip Thorne, for instance, hasn't conceded his bet, and, and people like Penrose certainly aren't convinced. But but nevertheless, the, the solution convinces some people. But it's a solution for an observer outside and very far away from a black hole. So it, it predicts what an observer outside a black hole would see, and it gives a prediction consistent with that with what we expect for classical general relativity in, in short time scales, but over long time scales it's also consistent with unitary quantum mechanics. But it's a solution only for an observer outside the black hole. So, so you might ask the question, what does an observer who crosses the event horizon and falls into the black hole see? And from classical general relativity you should, should see nothing as you cross the event horizon, you only see these problems when you hit the, hit the singularity, but but it's it's not obvious what would happen in a quantum field. Perhaps some people have suggested that any observer who crosses the black, black hole event horizon, even before he he reaches the singularity, would be just you know burnt to to a crisp even as he crosses the event horizon, which would be a a new quantum effect in places where we don't expect, expect quantum effects to be relevant. That's that's not very good. But there could be other other possibilities. But you might say it's not even a sensible question for a scientist to ask. Just like no one asks what does an electron see as it goes through the two slit experiments, this two slit experiments. Nor and in fact, even if you do send an astronaut in and let let him fall into a black hole, you'll never be able to report the results of his observations back to you. So so it's like asking what happens after you die. It's it's not a question the scientific community can a priori know an answer to, but it's it's a question this an individual observer would know an answer to and it's well it's a priori question and that's probably why people aren't convinced. But however if it's it's still better than, than nothing and, and sort of a, a small victory for quantum mechanics over gravity and and whether Pascal himself is satisfied with the argument, he accepted his prize, which was an encyclopedia of his choice, and that's the eighth edition of, of total baseball, the ultimate baseball encyclopedia, which is which is an American sport similar to cricket. In case you have not this part. So that, that's it. Thanks. Yeah, so that's it. So, uh, so is it right to say uh, that Hawking, in some sense, he's saying that, uh, I mean, fundamentally, you cannot be sure that black holes are formed. So, is he denying the, I mean, the existence of black hole itself, or because if that is so, then that trivially will, uh, you know, uh, if there's no black hole, then obviously there's no, no information about paradox. So, is yeah. that trivial, or uh, what no, it's, 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 it's like saying that, I mean. If you shoot an electron through two slits, you don't know which slit the electron, and you observe the interference pattern, then you don't know which slit the electron went through. Right. So he's saying that, okay, I mean, we'll make observations of a black hole from far away. We'll get, okay, radiation and stuff. The radiation would, would look like there's a black hole if, if, you, if you don't look very carefully, but if, if you look carefully, you would find that it, it contains two contributions, one from a universe with a black hole, one from a universe without a black hole, and they interfere in a way that preserves the information. Okay, so, so, so it's, it's, it's not really, it, I mean, I guess it's saying that, I mean, you don't know if there's a black hole unless you actually go in. That's what you saying. It's not, so it's, yeah, it's not that satisfactory, I guess. So, but it's, so I mean, if there is a contribution uh, uh, from the space-time sheet where black hole do exist, so there will be, 
so some some probability of existence of black holes that will contribute to something right to so there may be i mean uh, information loss with some probability that can happen right if there is contribution like like you if you send electron through both the slit you have one amplitude coming from one slit other another amplitude from other slit so right so they both contribute to both the probability contribute. amplitude so, but when you consider both contributions you get a result consistent with preservation of information if you consider just one contribution you lose information yeah right that's that's the answer it works for an observer outside the black hole it, it doesn't it may not be satisfactory if you actually send an observer into the black hole that's why everyone isn't happy with it